Hello, everyone. Welcome to another e-learning hot seat here. I am super psyched to have Seb Francis with me today of Titus Learning. I actually, I think you guys just call yourself Titus now, don't you? Just Titus, yeah. I know. I, I, we've been working away. together for so long that I, it's, it's in my mind, it's always Titus Learning. So I apologize for that. Um, Seb, you know, I know that you just changed where you are in the world. Where, where do we find you? Yes. So I am in um, Yorkshire, wonderful Yorkshire in the UK at the moment, but been in okay. Dubai for a couple of years. Um, so I'm looking out of the nice greenery and blue skies as well. Um, I was just going to say, nice. is it is it actually summertime? Is it really? Yeah. Like... Not, how professional do I have to be with the camera? Can I swing it around and <laughs> just show you out the window? It's lovely. It's lovely. Sure. So, you know, I'm, I've known you for a long time. I'm, I've had the pleasure of having you on, on podcasts and on the e-learning success and whatnot. There are still obviously lots and lots of people out there who don't know who Titus is. Um, yeah. Can you give us the 30 seconds on what is Titus? What do you provide? Um, and why, you know, why are you sitting in the hot seat today? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we started in 2013. So we just come up to eight years old. So we'll have a nice birthday bash in December. We mm. are a premium partner, one of the largest in the world, and we focus on Moodle and Moodle Workplace services, and that's usually a fully managed solution, so all of the technical setup, configuration support, uh, as I mentioned before, we start chatting a little bit about content creation now as well, but really the end result for the client should be a, a full system and, and support team around that from ourselves, so they can offer the, the online teaching and learning they need within their organization. Cool. Now, uh, you know, this, this again for you will seem like less than, you know, a 101 question, but what does that mean? I mean, Moodle is something that somebody, you, you can go out there. They've actually had a, a huge run, just like so many other e-learning providers in the world over the last 14 months, right? I think their user base almost doubled, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah, and the downloads, so, of, you yeah. know, so it's an open source software. You can go out, it's a learning management system, so many people. So if I can go out and get it for free, why do I need Titus? Like, what do you do, uh, yeah. you know, that, 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 that makes this a better thing? Yes, of course. Yeah, I think I'm about ten years deep answering that question now, but it's a it's a good one. Let's hear the pitch. I want to hear the pitch right now. <laughs> um, so, so for us, so yeah, as, as you said, there's there's masses of people using Moodle, and there is your completely free. You can go out and download it version, and that that's really good. So the, the beauty about it is, is if you need to start with e-learning, your budget is small. Potentially, your user base is small. Um, if perhaps you've got the internal expertise and you don't need to work with a partner, you've got an amazing tool that's massively supported by the community and you can you can learn for free and that that's at the core of the kind of Moodle mission is making sure people can use this system to, to be educated wherever they are where we come in is very much around um, supporting those who have not got the technical expertise internally um, or perhaps they have but they want to expand it and, and work with us so we'll often work with universities who are very well versed with Moodle and hosting and security but they need a, a development team to lean on to enhance the, the functionality of it. So we'll assist there, for example. Um, others, they just won't have any technical expertise and we'll jump in and we'll help with the whole support piece, train them how to use the platform. So I think from where we started, where it was very kind of transactional hosting and the, the general support, now it's looking at, okay, how can you create a better learning experience with the platform as well? So our team of, of, of trainers and delivery managers, learning technologists, they're working with people. So this is how you create better content, more engaging content. Um, this is how you improve the UI and the UX of the platform. So really we plug the gaps that they might have within their organization um, to make sure that they can use it the, the best possible. Mm. Now, I, I know you work with a ton of different companies. The, I hope this isn't too much of a curveball question. How different are the sort of the interface and the needs from, let's just say, one company to the next? I mean, mm -hmm. do you see trends as, as you know, over time or, you know, is a big corporation di different than a smaller organization in terms of would they really need a whole different set of Moodle? They really need a whole different set of services or mm -hmm. is, it, is it usually like here's the 80 percent and then there's a kind of the 20 that you're customizing? Like, yeah. Yeah, you stole, stole my answer somewhat towards the oh, end, but it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, but it is, it is very much that you've got you've got your, your eighty percent or so, which is the Moodle the Moodle platform, the engine, all of that functionality exists there. But ultimately, what every one of our clients will be doing, regardless of who they are, who their end clients are, sometimes the size of them, the location, it's all about that delivery of content. 
there is always or usually that interaction in between where the users absorb the content, maybe um, kind of show or, 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 or prove their understanding of that content, and that's usually assessed. Um, and that might be an ongoing thing they do every year, or it might just be a, a one-off piece of work. Um, and that could be homework for a school child, that could be something linked to a dissertation for a university student, or it could be professional development. So I've just got off the phone with a, a law firm who are looking at the, the CPD that they need to do each year and the set amount of hours. Likewise, we've got athletes mm. using our systems to uh, upskill on the latest techniques or the latest rules and regulations within their, their sports as well. So it is, it is massively varying in terms of the clients we work with um, and other companies as well. But I think you've got a real core um, that is the same for everyone. And then back to your earlier point about the user interface, user experience, that's where you do get a lot of differences, so obviously. If you've got a seven-year-old student versus a 47-year-old professional, the interface they're working with is, is very different. And the teams within those organizations as well, and the level of support they need is, is also going to be different. So for us, it's kind of the same behind the scenes. You, you tweak it for each customer you work with, um, but the, the end result is, is the same that we're pushing for. Mm. For everybody who's listening, um, I'm here with Seb Francis from Titus. Uh, it, you know, if you have questions, Moodle, Moodle Workplace, uh, learning management systems, you know, e-learning in general, whatnot, that's what we're talking about today. We'd love to have your questions. Just throw them into the chat. We do see them. Uh, if you're on LinkedIn, if you're on Facebook, or if you're on, on YouTube, uh, please do join us. One of the things that you mentioned uh, uh, just a few seconds ago was about that you are doing more content creation for clients. Break that down. What does that mean? Are you actually building out courses? Are you building out? I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth. What does that mean, content creation? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it was it was quite an obvious one um, for us, although it probably took us longer than, um, than we realized to, to get to that point of content. We were so very focused on providing the best platform possible, the best support and service around that, that platform, and, and, and often as well customization and, and development. So often we will integrate with other um, systems. We will create new features and new functionality for the platform. Um, but going back to what I just said, the ultimate purpose is that delivery of, of content. So it was more of, a, I'd say, um, a reactive thing for us at the Titus, which we've then developed since. So clients coming to us and saying, you do all this wonderful stuff for us. We've got the content that sits on top of it. And depending on the organization, you'll have some organizations who have unbelievable content creators internally. So they take something from a subject matter expert, we need to teach on X, Y, Z. It could be your very basics of health and safety, GDPR. It could be something um, very specific to the job role that that person needs to be learning through onboarding or that continuous development. But either way, the content needs to be there for them. So we've started a few partnerships with the likes of Go One, which integrates wonderfully well with Moodle. So that is all of your pre-made content. So mm -hmm. Basics, like I mentioned before, your health and safety, GDPR, um, some compliance related bits as well. That can just be pops into the platform. There's tens and tens and tens of thousands of resources out there. And really what you're getting with that is, is a time saving. You can get something off the shelf, put it into your platform. It's a plug and play type format and you're ready to go. You can start your learning. Um, it's also trusted. It works in the same way in terms of rating scales and uh, being verified by other users as well which is pretty nice. So saves you a bit of time. Uh, the content has been tested by others, created by others. Um, you also have the uh, custom content that can be created. So as I mentioned, either internally with your content creators or coming to someone like ourselves. So we then spend that time working with their subject matter expert. We will storyboard it and say, look, are we looking for a more informal, maybe micro learning type piece of content? Is it something that's very structured and formal? Um, is it SCORM? Is it video? Is it documentation? What interactions do you need with that? Um, and, and really where you've got strong, I suppose like a strong brand presence within firms, they like to have their own content. If it's something that's a, a very specific or niche area. so. We do work with the, um, the Royal College of Surgeons and they're working with surgeons in the UK mm. and globally. 
And obviously the, the type of content is very important. It's correct, it's up to date, it's, it's where we need it to be. We don't want any Let's hope. Let's left in bodies. <laughs> Who else surgical to say? I hope their content's up to date. Yeah, yeah, yeah well it is, I'm, I'm pleased to say. Um, we've, we've done stuff with uh, quite a few in the medical field as well, actually. We were looking just the other day at um, the structure of dog spines because that was some content we'd created. So there's, yeah, some weird and wonderful stuff, but it goes from that and then through to, I mentioned athletes as well. We were British weightlifting. Um, that would be if you're an official at the Olympics and you are um, officiating an event, okay, well, how should we be stacking the weights? How do we judge a lift that is correct or not correct? So you kind of get the idea that the content is massively wide ranging. Wide, mm. wide ranging. So our job is to sit in between. So we understand the platform and all its functionality. We work with the subject matter expert who gives us all of that content and then we digitize it. We, we make it interactive if, ne if necessary. And then the ultimate goal is just making sure that the content is delivered in the most efficient way and also the most engaging way um, so that the users are coming onto it and really avoiding this thing that you probably had with LMSs of kind of years gone by where it was a it was a chore to go on to something. It's a chore to go on. It's a chore to go line by line by line and a compulsory quiz at the end of it. It's, it's how can we introduce new types of, of content and, and the team here, they've just introduced something called L&D Insights, which I think we'll probably chat about, but it's a, a series we've released and it's sharing some of our understanding of, of the e-learning market and other external experts as well. And they've put sections out there on, on micro learning and that type of stuff as well. So yeah, content is ultimately what's been delivered and wherever we can help to um, create the best type of content and then we do. I want to hear about L&D Insights, but, I, but before that, talk about the, the I, I don't know. I want to call it the rise of the instructional designer. I just mm. feel like this is one of the hottest jobs in, you know, e-learning and it has been for a while. We've just seen this trend uh, going up. Is that what you know? Do you have IDs on staff? Um, and, and is that is that your bridge between the subject matter expert and sort of delivering that content? Um, tell me where, where, you know, where do you see that profession or that that slice of this per, uh, of the e-learning universe going these days because there are so many i mean it's everything from virtual reality to your standard you know sort of you know self-paced compliance training mm -hmm. what, you know talk to me a bit about what do you where do you see that role and and how are they interacting is it more independent contractors or is it companies are hiring these like you know how are you using them etc yeah yeah no, it's, it's, it's massive i mean for us um all the way from day one we were aware that we needed to have that pedagogical expertise within within the company, um, understanding how, understanding the science of, of teaching and learning, I suppose, and then it, it's, it's marrying that with the technology, and really that's what we see an instructional designer as, really, it's understanding the teaching and learning side, the technology, and bringing the, the two bits together in, in a way that works well. Um, so certainly within our delivery teams, we find that's really useful. So. Even if we're not using, um, even if we're not doing the content development itself, we will still be configuring the platform, and it's still a, a case of trying to understand how do we best build the platform to allow the end users to create good content and tie that into that instructional design bit. So, for us, anyone with that kind of previous teaching and learning experience, instructional design, learning technologist experience has, has become more and more important, and kind of building the team out there. Uh, we're also seeing it, which is really nice, on the side of our clients and, and those guys kind of um, bringing in-house more instructional designers. And yes, we speak with the technical counterparts within the companies and make sure the system's set up correctly, but you've got then instructional designers pressing you harder to make sure that it works well mm -hmm. as a teaching and learning tool, which is, is what, we, what we're here for, is to make it, as, like I said before, as fun and engaging as, as possible. So yeah, that has zoomed up. I think the wages have zoomed up with it just, <laughs> just about as quickly. Um, but they, 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 they're pushing the boundaries of, of e-learning as well. And like I said, it's, it's not just that click, 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 this is your mandatory training. It's how can we make this more enjoyable? How can you pick up your phone and do it on the train, on the bus? How can you start messing around with VR and AR and, and that kind of thing as well? And I think even just socially, people are, are getting more to grips with that. So the amount of people who would use Duolingo, which I think is a wonderful example, and it's gamified and it's quick to do, it's 10 minutes, you've got your notifications, you've got your leaderboards, you've got the social element of linking with your friends and your family. Um, they're pushing the boundaries of what learning should be and making it a more all-encompassing thing as opposed to just 
go to your job, do your hour of PD a month and then shut it down. So instructional design feeds into that. Um, and ultimately it's, it's creating a well-structured course, a well-structured site that is intuitive, that's a joy to use and yeah, doesn't feel like a, a real pain. So tell me, as someone who's been doing this for 10 years more, um, if I'm an instructor in, let's just, you know, I know that you, you, know, you, you straddle both uh, corporate learning and, and the higher ed space and, mm -hmm. and, and other clients. I still hear every day from people who are like, you know, the technology is overwhelming. The, the number of options are overwhelming. I don't know where to start. You know, i you know, I've been, I've been a teacher for 20 years, but now I'm asked to do A through Z. Like where, where do you still counsel people or your clients to start taking those first steps in, you know, not, not necessarily getting into the e-learning space because I feel like we're all there in mm. some or, but, but starting to build the muscle and is there particular directions that you counsel them on or where do you go? Yeah. So it's, and I'll see if I've interpreted the question the right way and I'll, I'll go ahead and answer, but mm. we were chatting just, so as I mentioned, I've just moved from Dubai back to the UK and right. whilst just before I was leaving there, a company had, had come to us and said, we need, um, we need some learning for our staff. I was like, well, what, 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 what else? Have, <laughs> That's what a great have question. Got? I like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was more of a statement, which made it even trickier. But um, yeah, we, we need some learning for our staff. And, and then for me, there's like a set of questions almost I would, I would go through. But where you start is for me is less so with what content do I create or what system do I use or is it mobile? Is it is it desktop? It's all around what are your requirements and what are the desired outcomes. So in terms of where do you start, it's the starting is with what's the desired end result so as opposed to step one, step two, step three. So for those guys, I was trying to say, let's, let's map out that, that user journey. So who, who do you expect will be using it? Where and when do you expect they'll be using it? What type of... Um, subjects not necessarily content what type of subjects will you be covering and then once you start fleshing all of that out and and i've talked to people before when they're starting businesses and they say how do i write a business plan and i just said write write a letter or write an email to your mom or to your friend you don't have to literally click send but this is what i'm thinking and if you did the same with with learning and you start typing it out then what would they say to me if they wanted to create a new learning platform or, or content as well so it's all about, I think, looking at the requirements you have, the users you have, let's like say the, the outcomes that you've got as well, because the outcomes will vary hugely. If you're a professional services body, if you're a school, if you're a membership club, it's all going to be very different. Is it something that you're monetizing and you're selling the content? Is it free to your staff? Is it free to your members? Um, is it a nonprofit and anyone and everyone can access the system? There's a lot of things. So really, I'd say starting with those requirements and desired outcomes, and from that, you can start chatting to well, people like ourselves, other organizations and companies out there, um, and then look at, okay, what do you need to do and what solutions are there to, to meet those requirements? And also, I think, going back to when we started, and similar to what we probably did, it's, it's walking before you can run. You don't need to have that VR-focused content with all singing, all dancing from day one, because without those fundamentals and, and foundations, it's going to be much trickier. So absolutely aim for that and shoot for that, but focus on the foundations, look at your desired outcomes and try to find what solutions will, will meet those requirements. Mm. So take me to L and D insights from there. So from rather from the client perspective to the, I'm, I'm assuming I, I apologize. I haven't seen L and D insights mm. yet. Is this professional development for again, instructional designers, instructors, clients, or what is, what is L and D insights focusing on? Yeah. Yeah. So, Really what we want to try and do with, with L&D Insights, and I will give 100% credit to our wonderful marketing team and copywriters for this. So I'm just the first that gets to take the glory. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll give a shout to Callum and Deck, who are the guys, the guys who've been smashing it. So um, really what I think we realized is that we've got a whole load of customers, uh, a whole load of people within the industry who we speak to might not be customers, but within all of that and our staff here, we had just a, a hell of a lot of expertise and understanding about the market. So a lot of the content we pushed out was relatively short form. It'd be your top five things for X, Y, Z or, or quite topical or seasonal. And what we wanted to do was try to condense a lot of that knowledge and that expertise and put it into usually like sort of white papers to begin with and share. So we've done one on hybrid learning, which obviously technology plays a part of, and then flexible working. We've done things that have been topical in terms of last year with COVID and still this year with COVID. Um, and then bits, like I mentioned, micro learning and other topics as well. So it's, it's picking a topic, it's going out to 
internally within Titus and also our external network and trying to pull opinions, pull ideas together, and then put that in a format that's really easy to digest for others. And then as we get further along, looking at tying some further video content and other stuff. But what we want it to eventually be is just as a, a hub of e-learning knowledge. So if someone has a question such as, where do I start when it comes to e-learning and learning management systems, I would like to think on L&D Insights, there's some kind of content that would, would help them. Or we've just come out of the back of COVID, our staff are questioning what are we doing for flexible or hybrid working. Well, L&D Insights will be there as a, as a tool to help. So I think as we've got bigger and we've got a little bit more freedom with, with time, with resources, with finances, whatever it might be, it's trying to just, I suppose, give back to the wider community with some really, really solid um, help and advice related to e-learning and other little areas as well. How are you dealing with the hybrid? I mean, you just, I, I don't know if it was a Freudian, Freudian thing. I, you know, it's interesting <laughs> to see where people's, where people's brains are with, with the pandemic. But, you know, you said we are, hey, we're in, we're in a post-COVID world now, right? Mm. In, uh, which I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in the same mindset, but what, yeah. how is, how is Titus doing with that? And, and are you finding that you're counseling uh, some of your clients about, you know, best practices and, and, you know, you know, how to manage that, you know, like, how do you, how do you do the hybrid, you know, go to a hybrid model rather than a full remote model, those kinds of things, or is that a part of your conversation? Yeah. So I, I probably said post COVID cause I'm a, an optimist at heart. So we're not, <laughs> maybe not you know 100% there's no, there's not there. Be any, there's no good, there's no right answer. I just, I love that. I, I, I love yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. That's a great, that's a great thing. Yeah. Yeah. When we were book, booking our flights to the UK, actually, I think we, we landed on the 20th and my friend had said, did you purposely do it on the day before the whole country is meant to come out of lockdown? Is that right? Oh, hey, that's a little, a little bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we have, I think a lot of those conversations probably happened nine to 12 months ago. And, and we're still seeing the positive effects of that though within our clients and how they're using the platform. So the likes of um, Zoom plugins and Zoom integrations and the guys at Big Blue Button and that, that, that was absolutely crazy in terms of getting the, the virtual classroom and, and virtual and video conferencing stuff nailed. Um, the interesting thing was that clients needed to go a step further. How do I see people are engaged with their screen, the camera, they're not off on some other app or on the phone. Um, how do we check that um, from a, I suppose like a, a checking that it's the right person doing the exams and, and that kind of thing as well. So they had the same requirements as before, i.e. virtual or video conferencing, but heightened requirements around that as well. So we had a lot of that. We had a lot of the technical questions about how do we go from 100 concurrent users to 10,000 concurrent users and everything in between as well. So had a lot of conversations there. And I think there are certainly some nice things that have carried on through. Uh, and we had a chat with a chap who works within a, a behavioral psychology space as well. And he was talking a lot about Zoom and what does, does it, do people love it? Do people hate it? And I think there's, there's a bit of both, isn't there? I just had a great call with three other people in three different areas. It had been impossible to arrange on short notice. We had a really great chat. I've also come back to the office this this past week and we've got still on limited staff, but you get to see people face to face. You can have a coffee, you can nip out for a walk, you've got the nice chats in between and we're looking a lot at kind of staff well-being and culture and satisfaction. And I think that face-to-face -face part plays a plays a big piece of it as well. So over this past year, I think we've definitely been tested as a company to up upskill as well, if I'm honest, with certain bits, but how can people still deliver? as close to that level of training that they were doing before face to face, if that was the case and how can technology help support that? Uh, we've had our challenges internally as well with the flexible and hybrid working and I'm not saying we've, we've nailed it, but we are, we are getting there. Um, but it's been a, an interesting patch. I think it'll really change people's perceptions and actions of training and, and the whole face to face versus virtual moving forwards, but hopefully for the positive when they work out what things work for them and, and what things don't. Mm. As someone who is one of the largest Moodle partners, uh, you know, and service providers out there, um, sorry. And I, also, I just want to mention everybody who's listening right now, again, reminders, Seb Francis of Titus. Uh, if you do have uh, you know, a question for us, or if you do have something you want to just throw it in the chat here, we'll, we'll get, we'll get to it and we'll definitely call it out and have Seb answer it for you. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think about what are some of the really common challenges that you hear from clients all the time or that you experience with clients all the time that, um, and I don't want to necessarily say, you know, this is the one-on-one kind of stuff, but where do you find either the gaps 
or the you know the leapfrog moments that are that are happening with clients where either they're common problems you're running into or opportunities that you're seeing that are just aren't being captured or aren't being actioned on by companies yeah yeah so i think for us we, we get quite a few um interesting challenges with the different geographies that we work with so mm -hmm. again whether this will directly answer the question or not i'm not too sure but it's where you'd said leapfrog was the bit that, that kind of took me down this path so we've got a few clients in china i'll, I'll use china and africa in particular um and then the two is either distance related um and or connectivity uh, related as well. So I think where you talk about the, the leapfrogging, um, which has been really interesting is mm -hmm. obviously access on mobile devices, which in itself is not necessarily a leapfrog, but it's the mobile devices, it's the offline availability, it's the payment for courses via SMS that then come through to that device. So we've seen some really interesting challenges there over the past year and trying to work that out. So how does a parent in uh, the middle of Africa with very little internet get access to learning resources for their child on their phone. That's an obvious challenge. So there's been some really interesting bits of development we've had to do around that to make sure that type of thing can happen. Uh, I'm glad to say that we've done it and that customers are happy. Um, so that, that's worked for us really well. And I think in terms of the the leapfrogging, it's, we've seen an acceleration this past year in terms of that, the, the virtual classroom bit. And the thing that impresses me the most probably is the schools and the universities. If you had said to a teacher, we need you to go 100% online learning within four weeks, they would have all looked at you like you're absolutely mental. Now mm -hmm. they managed to do it and fair play to the teachers, the schools, the academies and everyone else who's, who's done it. But I think you've just seen an acceleration. It's kind of proved what you, you can do um, if, if you need to do it really. And like I said, I think a lot of those things will stick around and where people might have looked down upon um, distance learning previously. So I, I went to the Open University for, I think I lasted for all of, about a year before I, <laughs> before I stopped, um, but nonetheless I went. Um, but where people might have looked down on certain um, distance learning before, now they're looking at it as actually that's a very viable option. The quality of it is, is nearly as good. The qualification I get at the end of it is, is exactly the same, um, but it allows me to do whatever else it is. So I don't have to live in a city center or I don't have to live in a different country if I want to mm. study at a particular university within a particular specialism. So it's accelerated things massively. I think it's allowed people just as yeah, humanity to see what they can do if you really need to do something. Um, and I think like I said before, they'll, they'll pick the best bits of what's worked over this past year and hopefully keep on with those and, and keep pushing the boundaries as well. The way that you sort of ended that that question or that your response there makes me believe that most of your clients or most of the people you're talking with have looked at this as an opportunity to make those investments, do culture changes, et cetera. But we've seen, I mean, New York Times had a, had an article, I don't know, this is 10 days ago, like, you know, we're, we're, we're doing this on June 30th right now, but, you know, at the middle of this month where e-learning you know the teachers are coming out e-learning was such a disaster we need to shut it down like quite literally this is like the headline mm -hmm. in new york times or um you know uh, the online experience for my kids over the last year was a complete failure you know and i need that i need them to go back to school um so we we, we still hear a lot of those voices and there's there's still a, a large number of institutions let's just talk higher ed for right now who are saying look we're ready to go back to the way it was what you know what are your thoughts on that and are you hearing that at all from your client base or or you know what would be your what would be your advice i mean i know that we are both evangelists for the e-learning universe but um mm. talk to me a little bit about that yeah no de definitely we did um, a chat not so long back and they were asking whether they thought that at the time in the midst of, of covid when everything was online do we think this could stay there forever and absolutely not from from day one we've always said that the power is with the, the educators, be that a learning and development manager within a company or a teacher or a tutor or a lecturer. Um, the power's always been with those educators and, and without them, you've not got the content, you've not got the engagement, you've not got the um, the counsel and, and the, the assistance you need from, from the people behind it. So always technology is there to support the people, but it does give you that opportunity, like I said, to reach, reach people further um, and, and as well looking at accessibility and reach people it might not have been able to, to reach previously. So we, even if I look at it from a, a business perspective, I know there are a lot of firms who are saying, actually let's shut the offices, we can do this remotely. Mm -hmm. I personally think that's quite a shame. I think, yeah, actually, 
it's shown that there should be more hybrid working and also I think there probably should be more hybrid learning and distance learning, remote learning. Um, but I think to lose that whole face-to-face -face and personal element would be a, a real shame, um, but it does just make it a, a bit more accessible. So for us, I think people are looking forward to getting back to a bit of normality, um, but love the fact that they can go, actually, I can work from home, I can learn from home, I can teach from home, um, and they've got a few more options than just being sat in one place and or sat in traffic. So. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, we have a question here from a person who I apologize. I'm going to destroy their family name. Her name is Camelia Hejorita. We'll just leave it there. Camilla. You're in Mexico City. You need to get practicing. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I do not think this is a Spanish name. Um, but anyway, uh, the question is, what would be the balance between synchronous and asynchronous learning to get a successful hybrid learning program? So I think, I mean, if if I may, you know, the the essence behind this question is, you know, how do we get that balance, right? Like, as you just said, something, you know, that human element being together, the, you know, the nonverbal communication, the energy of, of being together is, is critical, but then being able to do stuff offline, you know, in your own time is, is clear as, you know, is, is a clear advantage as well. Do you have mm -hmm. advice for, you know, creating that balance and, and the way that you, uh, you structure stuff with your clients? Yeah, so again, it's, it's all going to be dependent on the, the type of organization you're working with. Um, going back to some of the work we've done previously with, with schools, obviously a, a hot topic then, and still still now to some degree, was that whole concept of the flipped classroom. And I think that's something I've always quite liked the idea of, whether it's been with uh, learning and e-learning or other concepts as well. So having users go away, learn some topics, learn some information, come back together and then have that discussion um, and have more of a, I suppose, like a, analytical and evaluative discussion around what they're learning um make some challenges pose some questions but ultimately do the learning element in their own time of, of absorbing the content i should say the learning i think is kind of um affirmed when you have that discussion and, and then it's, it's truly kind of understood but i think for that that balance it all depends on the organization sometimes you need to be in front of a person if it's a physical skill you're learning it's much easier there in, in person um, but other times I think there are topics you can go off, understand, come back together, discuss, and often those discussions either help cement the learning um, or introduce new bits that you've not thought about. And it's it's always really interesting to see how different users interpret it, especially if things are done separately. So there's no kind of hard and fast formula, um, but certainly that, that flipped classroom has, has always worked well, I think. Fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm wrapping up my conversation here with Seb Francis of Titus. Uh, you know, I, I, first, before I thank you for your time, final question I have for you is what are you looking forward to uh, for the second half of here 2021 and into 2022? Is there a shiny new object coming down, down the pike that you guys are excited to roll out? Um, is it, is it more of the same and, and continue to build those muscles of hybrid learning and, and remote work? Um, I, you know, again, I probably led the witness here too much, but it, what, do, what are you looking forward to? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think if I'd, uh, if I disappeared and didn't mention 4.0, then I'd probably be in, in trouble. Uh, so Moodle 4.0 is, is coming, uh, a whole load of new um, user interface, user experience improvements that are going to be, yeah, just, it, the, the interface of Moodle is something that people have, have always talked about and, and we as a firm have done elements to improve that, HQ have done a lot to improve that, other partners have, um, but this is going to be one of the most significant shifts. So Moodle 4.0 is, yeah, without a doubt, something we're looking forward to the release of and kind of involved in that development and testing piece. So probably it will be next year, I think, before clients start getting it once everything is, is done and rolled out and tested. Uh, Moodle Workplace, which we're, we're big advocates of, that is is moving on massively as well. Um, we're developing that in-house as well as working with, with Moodle HQ, of course. So um, those two are biggies for us personally. Really looking forward to seeing the, yeah, the team back to a bit of normality. Um, and I just can't believe, what are we on? The 30th, yeah. Wow, yeah. We're six months done, so it's gone very quick. So if it would slow down a little bit as well, that would be, be nice. <laughs> I yeah I honestly can't believe that tomorrow's July first. It's uh, yeah. it absolutely blows my mind. Yeah, that we're we're literally entering the summer vacation season. Uh, I know, mm -hmm. you know you in Europe as well. Um, Seb Francis. 
thank you so much for taking the time out of your day today. I know you're a super extremely busy guy, but I'm um, always love chatting with you. Um, for everyone who has been listening, but uh, you know you couldn't get your question out there or or didn't find time to put it in the chat, um, or you're listening to the recording of this, please do put the put your questions in the chat there. Uh, Seven, I do answer them afterwards. We do monitor it, so please join us in, in that way as well. Seb, thanks so much. I wish you the best uh, best day, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you very much. Pleasure.